hey, this is Russell, and I work at the video store, the place that you can go to once a week whenever it is movie night. I love this job. I get to talk about movies and series with my friends when the store is quiet, and then interesting people pop in to rent something. We can help you figure out what you can be watching on streaming platforms and out in cinemas. All right, let's do it. Let's open up the shop. Good morning. Morning. <laughs> you guys are so good. You can be a little barbershop choir. Uh, hello, everyone. Welcome to the video store. My name is Russell. I am here with Cole. Hi. And Graham. Hi, G-Force. G-Force. And we have a very special episode today. Uh, a good friend of mine uh, called Darcy is going gonna, is gonna to visit me. So I catch up with this gentleman whenever yes. I can, wherever I am in the world. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to turn our coffee catch-up into an episode. Awesome. <laughs> he doesn't know this yet, but that's what's going what to happen. What are you, happen. surreptitiously yes. recording it on your phone? No, well, I just, I'm at this, no, I'll tell him, you'll know what's going on. But okay, it's good. like, um, he's just an interesting dude. Mm. Um, so we'll get into it, but he comes from a history of publishing very cool magazines, one of which is a full magazine called Little White Lies, and that's how I know him. But he is now very heavily involved in the world of AI, and I think that is fascinating. What mm. an interesting pivot. Yeah. Yeah, and so we will get into it, and I just think for all those who tune in every week, um, once again, you're in for a treat, because here is a very interesting topic and told through someone who is living it every day so yeah. i think we've got our perceptions of what ai is and then there's the reality of the people who are actually coding these things yeah. and it might not be sort of as evil as you think or it might not be as advanced as you think but um it's still very exciting and it's very cool to just hear how this all works um we are going to um get into his film that his company has made, and it's important to mention at this point that it is available on YouTube. The links uh, in the description of our episode will will link you to that, and more information about the company he's a part of, um, for all those who are interested. Mm. Um, and then all of those joining for perhaps the first time, and you don't know how this all works, um, we've got ourselves a lovely day here at the video store. Uh, we've just opened up our shop. Mm. Uh, we're going to catch up on one or two little things. Then Darcy will pop in. And then please stick around for after that chat where myself, Cole and Graham are going to chat about the movies that we have been watching recently. We are now at the point with the video store where we get invited to special premieres. And so we get a chance to watch movies beforehand, um, which is very cool. And um, then we get to talk about them here, yeah, which is great. Um, we want to talk about um, Argyle, which mm. is in cinemas. We want to talk about The Zone of Interest, which is in cinemas as well as The Bioscope which is very exciting, yeah. and The Holdovers, which is coming, and then a couple of really cool TV shows. Um, let's do it, I think. Yeah. I think Jump let's right waste, into let's it, Let's waste man. no more time. No. Mm -hmm. um, Graham, you said you wanted to stick around for this chat. Yeah, why not? Cool. Sounds interesting. All right, well, yeah, well, you stick around. What are you going to do, Cole? I don't know, Graham, while Graham's eavesdropping, <laughs> I'm just, I'm just going to go read a magazine on the loo. <laughs> <laughs> The Little White Lies magazine. Lovely. Yeah. Okay, you do that. Um, this is Darcy popping in to rent something. How's it, Darcy? It's it's great. It's great <laughs> great to be here. We have completely hijacked your time. We were just recording um, an episode here when um, you arrived for our promptly scheduled catch up meeting to say hi, and then upon chatting, we realized, hold on. We have all the microphones set up and ready, and you are super interesting, and so you deserve to be a guest on the podcast. So we've hijacked your time, but welcome to the video store. It's, it's awesome to be here. Thanks. <laughs> uh, so just to uh, recap, Darcy is, a, is one of those really interesting people I've been lucky enough to have a chance to meet. You came to South Africa, what, four years ago? Three years ago? It was 20, 2015. So. 2015. And you... 
um, seeked out, uh, well, you came with because your wife had to work uh, and you could work anywhere in the world. And you were a part of Little White Lies, which is a fantastic film magazine, which we sadly don't get too much stock of here in South Africa. <laughs> but a lovely uh, testament to what a magazine should be, which is a beautiful piece of creative work um, as opposed to pulpy magazines, which we are seeing yeah. disappear one by one. But um, Little White Lies choose to have more illustration and incredible artworks um, and are more insightful. And so they become this almost collector's piece magazine. And so you arrived and introduced that to me um, because you seeked out... Um, Film Spaces in Joburg, and you found us. So perhaps uh, at that point, what was your impression of the bioscope? Well, I, I think even before I stepped in the bioscope, um, probably the first I'd heard of it was uh, the Guardian website had, I forget how many, but it was one of those list articles of like the 10 coolest independent cinemas in the world. And what? Yeah. Oh, you, you haven't seen this. <laughs> I don't remember if if that did happen. I don't remember that. Oh, you, oh that's, yeah, that's amazing. Yeah, so so that that's that's how I knew about the the bioscope right. originally, and um, and yeah, just just as kind of yeah, the the cultural anchor of Mabining. Um, yeah, it was kind <laughs> of. Uh, and so um, it was it was cool to then meet you, and it was cool to get a line, almost like you were a drug dealer. On, uh, on some good stock of that magazine, which you then were very cool to give us a bunch that we could sell in, this, in the store. And of course, they disappeared quite quickly. And I've been able to build a collection and every time I see you. <laughs> but you've moved on to lovely things, which we'll talk about. But perhaps uh, just if you can still speak on Little White Lies, what was that time like working for that magazine? Well, I, I think... Um I, I think it was really inspiring. And uh, and I'd my, my background before that was I was sort of a foreign correspondent for newswires and worked in Nigeria mm. and China and things like that. And uh, um, I was I was absolutely inspired when I first saw the magazine. And I thought it was incredible because um, other people were like Google and Google came to them and asked, oh, can you make a magazine for us as well? So um, so I just thought it was incredible, the creative energy that was, was going on there. So what, what came first, the service to make magazines or Little White Lies? Because... The company, Graham, yeah, because Graham's joining us as well. Hi. <laughs> um, um, the company were, it was a very interesting company. They were a company that said, we can make a magazine for you. Yeah. We can make a supplement. We can print. We can design. We can do layout. And and they had their own internal magazines, which were Little White Lies. Okay. Huck. So which came first, do you know? Yeah, def definitely it was the magazines first. And um okay, so and, and I think it was like like you said, um like a group of creative people who were kind of frustrated with what was on the newsstands. And right. uh, particularly film magazines where they were kind of like, Okay, it it, it feels so commoditized and mm. like uh, a lot of the big UK magazines, like we we know the editors and they're they're even saying, okay, we, we are told almost like a year in advance what our cover story is going to be. And wow. um, we sort of with, with Little White Lies, like the aim was to create um, something that felt like a conversation that people were having, kind of friends would have after, after seeing a film. Mm -hmm. And that was, that was the real desire. And uh, um, since, since they did have a bunch of clever designers, they had this, um, this cool rating system too, where instead of just giving like a five-star rating they would give three ratings the first one was anticipation out of five like how excited they were to see the film mm -hmm. then the actual enjoyment like how did they feel as they were sitting in the cinema and then in retrospect which was probably what uh every other critic does is like okay after you've uh, digested yeah, it all and right. written your article like how do you how do you do it so it so they tried to kind of create a bit of a kind of more transparent and raw and and to recognize too that that movies really mean different things at different moments for yeah. us. Yeah, and they, and they, yeah, a little bit like anything that you consume, you've got to think about it before, you've got to think about it during, and you've yeah. got to think about it afterwards. Because we've long since said um, one of the things that stuck with me after years of film school was um, was something um, the South African um, critic Leon Fanirop said to me in a lecture once, or to us, was that a a good film is one that leaves you different. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, 
you and the worst a film can do is just wash over you and leave you cold. So if you've if you've left angry or if you've left you know excited or motivated, then 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 that's the best way to decide for yourself yeah. whether or not it's a good film. Um, and what were some of the highlights of that time when you were part of that magazine? Because I'm sure you got to meet some folks. Or yeah, I think um, I mean. I, I think uh, one like the the absolute highlight was just kind of working with the creative team and thinking about um, thinking about what we were doing, but also thinking of new directions. Like we sort of when we were there, we we pushed into podcasts, we pushed into um, creating books and uh, doing a lot more exhibitions and and actually trying to take those international, which the Bioscope kind of helped us do. And yeah. Like, so then you you um, you know you were able to travel often from Joburg to go back and do things and, and you would often come back and bring presents, which I always appreciated. <laughs> and one of which was a collection of artworks that um, were all about the films of Guillermo del Toro um, as if they were reinterpreted as classic book covers. Um, there was probably about 10, 12 of these artworks which we then put up on the walls of the Bioscope and had as an exhibition. And so it was lovely to to do that and then um you were very kind to give us other stuff that we put up for a bit um and then you were very kind to uh have us keep one which was the um the big lebowski print which i have since framed and is as you come into the bioscope here at 44 stanley you can see it up on the wall mm. and many people want to buy it and i will absolutely <laughs> never sell it <laughs> <laughs> so thank you for those presents and thank you for giving us that stuff to sort of line the walls over the years and, and just make the bioscope look cooler oh it's it's great and I, I love like in the bioscope scope shop too how the um there, there's these this new series of artist prints of like cult films and amazing mm. yeah so so you were very much privy to the mobile space and then of course you you guys moved out of joburg uh where's home now so home's london now in london that's yes. right and then um, uh, moving here to 44 Stanley, we could rethink a lot of things and add some things. And one of which was a, was a gift shop, which we didn't really... You could, see, you could probably see the start of it in Mabuneng, but we could probably do it, do it now. Um, but a nice thing, Graham, speaking of London, yes. is that when I was in town um, in 2022, mm -hmm. it was May, April, May, um, I've sp spoken about it on the show yes. a few times where I was able to watch... Um, everything, everywhere, all at once. Yes, you mentioned at the that. the Prince Charles Cinema. Well, sitting next to me was this gentleman. Oh, right. Okay. So when I when I rolled into London, um, I wanted to catch up with Darcy, and um, being the film geeks that we are, <laughs> we didn't go to any kind of bar or yeah. anything or do anything wild. We went and watched a movie. <laughs> nice. But it I was approve. A, it, yeah, I know you would. I know you would. And and of course. I've said it on the show, but what made it special was actually seeing the Prince Charles for the first time and, and witnessing it. Because mm. I've only ever discovered it on Instagram, followed it, and realized that it's very similar in spirit to the Bioscope. Right. Um, if they were people, they would get on. Um, <laughs> the one would be be British, but yeah. but that they would have the same interests. And uh, and it was just so great. I, I think maybe you can speak on it, Darcy. It just it was just so great watching that movie in that space. Yeah, yeah, I think it was it was amazing, and it's such a um, it's such a crazy film. I, I guess that doesn't need to be said. But, but you, uh, you'd already <laughs> seen it, I, and then you were happy to watch it again with me. I, I'd already seen it, and I, I think I'd only seen it like forty eight hours before we went and saw it. Oh, so wow. I, I was still processing it, and there were all these little things that I wanted to kind of watch out for, mm. and. Um, and it was amazing because because the great thing about the Prince Charles is it's like right off Leicester Square, in London. So and, I remember. And so Leicester Square is, is famous for sort of being the movie part of London because that's right. where the big cinemas are. So when I was walking trying to find it, I saw the big cinemas that have these huge maverick posters <laughs> and screens, and yeah. I think that's where they would have done the premieres with Tom Cruise and yes. would have been in that square and then just off it. You know, just around the corner, and if you go even further, you're in Chinatown. Yeah, exactly, right. Prince Charles. Yeah, but it but it was amazing because um, yeah, we were talking about the film because um, we we also very rightfully uh, ate ramen. Yeah, shortly nice. before, <laughs> which is quite cool that there was this kind of Asian dinner that came before watching this sort of somewhat Asian film. 
it's it's yeah it's true it's it's the that film is it's an uh, amazing thing about the film i find is like it it almost like pushes you pushes you so far that's almost pushing you away at a certain point mm. and then everything stops and it basically just grabs you and pulls you in for a hug almost which, <laughs> yeah, yeah. which like that's a great way to put it and and i remember when we walked out um we walked into leicester square and it was almost midnight but the square was packed there were all sorts of like just thousands of people there and, and that yeah. was exciting for me yeah. now, graham is a south african yes. you could empathize we were at that point able to wear masks we were able to take our masks off outside yes but we still had to wear them inside yeah and of course joburg being joburg we're quite insular mm-hmm. we're not very pedestrian and out in these big public spaces all the time so for me, being able to walk through Leicester Square with all those people close to midnight on like a random week night, <laughs> then you got to go past Piccadilly. It was just so cool for yeah. me to be like um, um, around people <laughs> and no masks. And I was like, okay, well, I think we're making our way out of this. Yeah. But um, that film um, will struggle to find its right audience because it, it could be a bit confused or people don't really know what it was. And I know in South Africa, they um, putting it in a shopping mall cinema um, might have been the wrong audience, um, yeah. but but the Prince Charles was the perfect audience because those people knew exactly what they were coming for, and they were the kind of people that would appreciate that film. Mm. And I was so glad to be in this full cinema and experience it because it is such a participatory film. Yeah, you gasp, you laugh, you you know you you with it. It's a wild ride. <laughs> so thank you for being a part of that. <laughs> no, it's it's great. Yeah, no, I w- I wouldn't. I mean. Yeah, Russell from the Bioscope calls you up and says, hey, you want to go see a film of <laughs> Prince Charles? You're like, what? there's only one answer. So. You're too kind. <laughs> um, and so let's, check, let's chat a little bit now about what it is that you're doing. So um, I, guess, I guess kind of in the midst of, of COVID and lockdown, um, I'd, I'd moved from South Africa and the kind of big blue giant skies you have here to the kind of low hanging clouds of London (laughs) and um, small flats. We were basically like in a one bedroom flat, which you really couldn't go out of. It was like living in a space capsule in a Stanley Kubrick film or something. (laughs) And, uh, and, and in the midst of that, I had, I had this idea, Oh, AI is going to come and change the world. Like I, I want to learn what Mm. this is about. And, um, so uh, there, there was a um, an African AI company. It was actually founded in in North Africa and Tunisia, um, but has has a very amazing team of South Africans, kind of working mostly in Cape Town, but a few in, in Joburg as well. And they were they were recruiting at the time, and so I I kind of just sent my CV in and to see what happened. And uh, they they basically kind of brought me in as a kind of resident storyteller to. Uh, to, to start start kind of uh, working on how they could talk about what they do with the world and uh, and right. uh, okay so so they the guys that are going to be getting involved creating this AI what an AI thing that can what is it that they that they make because then you so then you've come on board to help market them to the world and communicate them so are they developing AI software well yeah so they're they're developing ai software okay. and a kind of ai and sort mm. of algorithms and um the way they the way they explain it um or the best explanation i heard is almost if you imagine kind of like a car company like toyota like they have a certain kind of chassis yes and then they can use that to make a corolla or to make a lexus it really just depends on what what is kind of needed at the time and what the customer is okay so they so they've they've made the chassis they've made they've made the chassis and, and they then, kind of adapt it uh, and then to depending the, on who comes to them mostly i would imagine african clients um surprisingly not i think they okay. um uh they they learned very early that they kind of had to go um go go to europe and kind of kind of uh, sell because, their because what are the cars in that analogy? What are they? What are they making? Because at the end of the day, sorry, because I can come from a somewhat ignorant place. Uh, AI at this point is making us cool artworks and it's making things, but it, it can obviously be so much more. Like yeah. we're seeing the sort of fun, designy, expressionist 
part, but of course there's other things, right? Yeah, so I, I think it's it's maybe helpful to take a step back and like look at what the chassis actually is. And okay. there, there's a very cool uh, film connection to that as well. Um, in 2017, um, there was this film that sort of premiered at Tribeca called AlphaGo. And um, it's about AI beating the world champion at the game of Go, which is kind of um, a, a game that's been around for for centuries in, in Asia and is almost a million times more complicated than chess. Oh, it's like a sort of Chinese checkers vibe. It's, it's Chinese checkers and the, and the the number of possible moves is greater than like the number of atoms in the universe. Oh, wow. So, okay. so it was it was kind of like in terms of like a benchmark of of how AI was progressing. Like they were once once kind of AI beat the best chess player. Go is like on the horizon of one of the next bigger challenges, and they actually kind of beat it like decades ahead of when it was expected using mm -hmm. a new kind of AI, and. Um, and that's the kind of AI we use, where it used to be like AI would work where you would program in a bunch of rules and then it would make decisions based on those rules. Because is that what that first was? The, the, the chess, the famous chess, what was it called? Deep Blue or... Uh, what was it, the one that beat Kasparov? Yeah, yes. yeah. Was that was that, that where yeah. it, just, it just said, well, if there's this, these are your options. If it's this, these are your options. Mm -hmm. And so... Exactly. It wasn't, it, it was quite closed in that sense. Yeah, and, and kind of like a decision tree um, of where, where with AlphaGo, what they did was, um, I think they might have started out using that, but then they started using a new kind of AI called reinforcement learning, where, uh, which, which kind of started out mostly in video games, where it would play the video game and like by crashing and dying a million times would kind of figure out how to play the game better and sometimes would do ridiculous things, like would almost like... There, there's videos you could see on the internet of like people trying to move like Indiana Jones characters like through walls and things like that, where it was just the AI kind of doing random experiments. And okay. um, the way reinforcement learning works is that it um, almost starts with zero experience and then through trial and error um, very quickly builds up like years, decades, centuries of experience of playing games and mm. becomes better than like the best human player. And that's what they used in AlphaGo. Um, okay. Nice. How long? How, do you know how long it took it to learn? I mean, uh, it, it could be instantly, or it could be like a program running for a little bit. Oh, it it definitely took took a while, and um, and they were kind of tweaking it. And and the great thing is, it's all it's all documented in this film, which you can see for free on YouTube. It, okay, it, I was about it was, to say. Okay. Yeah, okay, it was so it's in, on YouTube, and it's called. Um, it's called AlphaGo. AlphaGo. Cool. And uh, it it was. It, so, it, I think it had a limited cinema run, and then it was on Netflix for a while. But now anyone can see it for free. And so, okay, did right. you you'd watched that before you joined the company? I, I had, yeah. I think okay, when so you came at it. Okay. Yeah, and um, so so yeah, that that probably that very much kind of framed. So so they and this company was created. Um, I guess the founder was was from Tunisia, and he he actually has a, a great backstory. In his own, he's from Tatooine, which is where Star Wars was filmed. So he probably grew up just like thinking, "Okay, where's R two D two? Like where the like the future should be here." Uh -huh. um, and, obviously, Tatooine is the fictional name, um, right? It's yeah. it's. But it's, I mean, they shot they sh where they shot those scenes. Yes, was in Tunisia, Tunisia and yeah. I know that Morocco also has like some Star Wars sets that still mm. exist. Yeah, for you to but, go and but, find it, in but the it's middle of nowhere. Yeah, but it's actually like. They they didn't really put much effort into disguising where they shot it because the real <laughs> place is actually called Tatooine. Okay, uh, I was about to say. Okay, so yeah, how similar is it? So so they basically like took out an I and an A and uh, <laughs> okay, like it's okay. like really um, and and they did like they were they were extremely loyal. Like I think we um, I, I had the chance like when I first joined the company we were shooting a documentary and uh, um, yeah we we went to several of the Star Wars spots including like the Lara's farm which like. I think they must have shot like five movies yeah. in that. Like it's 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 now actually like a hostel where you can actually stay there. And, uh, oh, cool! Yeah, Graham Graham would go. Yeah, <laughs> you'd yeah. be there. <laughs> okay, right. Somebody so, needs so, to do like a movie set, like world trip yeah, planning cool. thing. Go to Hobbiton. Go to Tatooine. You know. Yeah, that'd be rad. Yeah. So um. So yeah, our our founder who is from Tatooine, he uh, he saw what um, Deep Mind, the guys behind AlphaGo, were doing, and he was thinking, okay, how could we apply this to industrial problems? 
and, uh, oh, and rather okay. than games. And that was that was where the big shift came. And um, and yeah, they did have to go outside of Africa to kind of find clients. But um, one one of they they found some very interesting clients like Deutsche Bahn, which runs the German railway system, which is one of the biggest in the world. They're they're looking at the future, and they sort of had a moonshot project, which is like how can we how can we basically get AI to the, the same way that it became the best player at Go can be like the best a superhuman railway operator and kind yeah, of like nice. help lower our carbon emissions, reduce delays, like reroute the system when something goes wrong. Um, so that that's a project that uh, that Instadeep was working on. And then um, okay, because I was about to say the company that you work for is called Instadeep. It's called Instadeep. Yeah. Cool. And uh, and then I guess another uh, during the time. Well, it, they actually started working together before COVID, but um, BioNTech, the company that's uh, kind of behind the Pfizer COVID vaccine, yeah, mm-hmm. um, they they started working with Instadeep to um, on cancer vaccines, and oh, wow. um, mm-hmm. and then when COVID happened, everything kind of pivoted towards getting a COVID vaccine yeah. as soon as possible. Yeah. And um, I know a lot of people say that so much research in other diseases like TB, like just all got lost because well, they went two years backwards because obviously right. COVID was just shoved to the front. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. But, but at the same time, like these amazing discoveries, like most, most of us now have these, this new kind of vaccine mRNA in our bodies. And, um, like just, just from probably hanging out with scientists, um, it's 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 pretty amazing, like just the basic technology there. Where instead of injecting a live virus in your body, it's just kind of stimulating your system to naturally create or to create the natural antibodies that mm-hmm. would kind of fight off something. So. That's what these vaccines, these COVID vaccines, were doing. That's and, what the COVID. And, it, and is that a similar principle to the cancer vaccine? And and it's it's the same principle to the cancer vaccines. Um, anything with mRNA, it's uh, it's basically sort of getting your body teaching your body how to create these like kind of killer t cells that can like kind of Wild. fight cancer yeah. and things like that and um and since everyone is different um these things in the future the idea is that ai can help personalize them so it won't be about kind of just fighting cancer it'll be about fighting like your cancer like what what specifically is kind of the patient that's needs. interesting yeah, so, yeah. wow because um, yeah. if if um if if Corona had a had a slogan, <laughs> it would be everyone's different. Yeah, because you spent the last two years going, well, I lost my smell, yes. and I'm doing, the, and it's like, well, everyone's different. Yeah, and so so it makes sense that that vaccines evolve to personalize, and the only way to do that is through AI learning. Yeah, well, I I think it's it's definitely um, it's definitely a faster way to do it. Yeah, you could probably we could probably get there in a million years if we kind of kept <laughs> pushing at it, but but AI can like. The, the same way it plays these games, it can just kind of like, as, as long as you can kind of frame a problem in kind of mathematical terms, it can just kind of do do like a thousand calculations a second almost, and kind of like, yeah, and and that's really the 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 main thrust and point of AI. I'm going to take this to a very simple, dumb space, <laughs> which is that obviously people have always been afraid of things taking over of things being malicious but i mean we're not we're terminator. far away People we're far away from terminator. that right <laughs> at this point we're still just using ai to to speed up thought right? yeah yeah i think i think in terms of like this this kind of i guess the frankenstein myth it is it is natural to be afraid of kind of new things and yeah. kind of things we shouldn't mess with i guess maybe jurassic park is probably the more like the the more recent kind of like but, example but, in everyone's but i mind. mean the idea of an ai being like in my head i think a lot of people probably more through hollywood are seeing it as um this sentient being right yeah now. yeah i mean are we there? how far away are we from there because yeah. like every now and again you hear about you know the what is the the microsoft one or someone all Chat. of a sudden be, being a racist within 20 minutes yeah because <laughs> he's yeah. learning from the internet yeah. yeah yeah so i i mean the best analogy i've i've heard for kind of the stage we're at it's almost like if you imagine the wright brothers when they were kind of like just taking off of kitty hawk for that first flight <laughs> like someone stopped them and said well wait a second like have you thought about like the 
the implications of interstellar travel. Like it's, yeah, <laughs> we're we're pretty far off, and like a lot of my colleagues would testify. Like like when we were talking, um, I remember at lunch we we all have lunch together, and we, we were talking about the plot of Dune and how basically like it 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 takes place in this world. Um, after there's been a war with AI mm. and they've decided, mm. okay, we can only have human navigators for, for computers and they need this, this drug spice, which yeah. is kind of a valuable commodity. But yeah, when, when one of my colleagues just said war with AI like that, that feels like my daily life because for them, <laughs> they feel like the AI is really stupid and not doing what they want it to do. Yeah. So yeah. they, they have to, um, it, it takes right now a lot of human work to kind of steer it in the right direction and get it right. to focus on the right things okay so so um ex machina is still quite a while away <laughs> quite quite a while away I think. <laughs> which is a great uh, film yeah, yeah definitely yeah and and that's it too it's it's amazing um i keep i keep kind of dropping these film references in but um i think when when you talk to anyone who's working in ai like that naturally is kind of their entry drug is sci-fi films yeah, yeah. And, and star wars in particular is has been like super powerful in that so mm-hmm. okay but yeah you 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 guys at this point are just helping trains run on time and <laughs> but i mean that's great exciting stuff and yeah. it's cool that that you can be on the forefront of that i'm sure you're enjoying this and i think i i find it also interesting that a tunisian startup can get these kinds of contracts and kind of sit at these tables because i'd imagine here's my other question is you're probably up against big dogs eh? yeah well it's it's or is this or is ai still a bit punk rock at this point it is actually surprisingly punk rock (laughs) yeah but i think too it's it's interesting to see who thrives in those atmospheres like um i guess my my world because i am kind of joining an african founded ai company that kind of a lot of the people I meet at the big dogs like DeepMind are actually South Africans as well. Oh, really? So um, like in London, there's there's a lot of South Africans working at DeepMind. And, and that... So that, is, is DeepMind a big competitor for you? DeepMind, well, I, they're, they're the ones who did AlphaGo. They're kind oh, of right. the... Um, they're, they're kind of the... the, the they're, yeah. they're a very successful company. But, but it's, um, I guess, in terms of like previous technologies like... This is a much more democratic technology as well. Like if you, yeah, is everyone kind of helping lay blueprints for everyone else? Yeah, and there's a lot of resources for learning, and it's it's like um like like one of uh, sort of the the founder who's from Tatooine, Kareem uh, Bagheer. He he kind of used the analogy in Africa. He said it's almost like nuclear power, where uh, for an African country to kind of build an Africa or a nuclear power plant that. That's almost an impossible hmm. thing, and we we see like issues with electricity all over the place yeah, and right. across Africa. Um, but AI is something that it is very punk rock. It is something like a kid in their in their bedroom can do all these courses online and start creating like powerful algorithms and models that um, can kind of change entire economies, like like and, it has. And then eventually, these these bigger companies and corporations will will use. Yeah, so that's exciting. Man. And 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 I think it's like the personalized atmosphere of it too. Like there's a big discussion about bias in in AI, and um, really the AI has to work for the people that it's serving. And there's so much diversity in Africa that like what mm. what is working for people in Silicon Valley isn't necessarily going to work for people yeah. here. So. And so you say you've made a film. Yeah, we we made a film uh, called Cape to Carthage, and um, it's just Cape uh, to Carthage. To Carthage. Well, um, where's Carthage? So Carthage is um, in Tunis. Okay. And it used to be the, um, I guess, uh, probably the most famous uh, of the Carthaginians was Hannibal, who took like the mm-hmm. elephants over the mountains, over the Alps, and then kind of like sneak attacked the Romans. Oh wow! And um, nearly, nearly beat them, um, and they got incredibly upset by that, and went and <laughs> basically burned Carthage. Yes, um, but, but Carthage uh, then, when the Romans took it over, it became the capital of what the Romans called the province of Africa. <laughs> And uh, so wow. riddled with ignorance. <laughs> yeah. okay, but this is a place in Tunisia, which it's a place in Tunisia, which, which is was part of the Roman Empire. Yeah, which mean. was part of part of the Roman Empire, and uh, okay. after it was at war with the Roman Empire. Okay. Um, and uh, so yeah, when you when you land in Tunis now, it's uh, the, there's this announcement, uh, which which we have at the start of the of the film, uh, like welcome to Tunis Carthage Airport, and you can 
go visit the old ruins and things like that. And um, is the film done? The film's done. Um, yeah. What, it's, what uh, are you doing with it now? So we we've just started submitting it to festivals, and we just got our first um, our first uh, official selection at the AI International Film Festival, which is in Park City, Utah, which is cool. famous okay. as the, the home of Sundance. So it's, yeah, uh, cool. And so. Um, so this is the start of the journey of this film. Is it a feature film? It's it's a short documentary, so it's about okay. twenty eight minutes long. Cool, okay, cool. And it obviously tells the story of the company. Um, I, I think we we wanted it to be about something bigger. So we wanted really we are looking at this question about um, sort of Africa's role in AI and okay. Why. So it's nice that it becomes something cool. a lot bigger than the. Film. Yeah, yeah. Okay. We were we were lucky. We were able to kind of bring in um, some other voices, including uh, some of the kind of South Africans who are working at DeepMind and uh, who, who have really, they've, they've created this, um, this great movement called the Deep Learning in Daba, which is, I think, the world's largest um, AI teaching event, which happens every summer. Okay. And uh, so we've, we've included that in the film as well. You can, you can kind of see, uh, see that world. And, uh, okay, cool. Um, yeah, well, we'll, we'll be able to try and share it and advertise it on the video store whenever it, yeah. it's possible. But yeah, it was just nice to catch up with you because as I said, this just to tie it back to the beginning, because I know that we, we're running out of time now. The point was to catch up with you. Mm. And I think what's exciting is I'm at this point in my life where I'm kind of using the video store as a chance <laughs> in many ways, more purposefully where I'm like someone who I really want to catch up with. I can have this uninterrupted conversation with them um, through the video store. Um, but for you, it was a bit hijacked where we were meant to have this conversation <laughs> out in the courtyard and then we realized it would make such a great episode. So thank you for last minute um, putting on the headphones and, yeah, definitely. and being a part of it. Oh, th- thank, thank you. No, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's a great opportunity. And uh, yeah, you're the, you're the first people I've spoken to the film about. So it's cool. Actually- well, it also, it, it's, it's, it, it, it's interesting because it actually is your job to be communicating what your company's doing. And yeah. so it's quite cool that you then were able to do that on this show. So. Yeah, I think like right now, given how so much of the conversation around AI is kind of more about the controversy of it, like stealing from artists and the fear that it's going to like take work away from existing artists, hearing about like this completely other side of what AI is doing is like essential. Yeah. That's really interesting. Yeah. And and I think that's that's it. Like we're, AI has definitely reached the point where, yeah, people – People from the arts, the humanities, like there, there's some tough questions we have to answer, and yeah. it's it's not just up to technologists to kind of tackle that. So, mm-hmm. so everyone has to kind of engage with it. So, yeah. So that's it's awesome. Interesting because I've often said that the engineers, whether you're building a bridge or you're building an AI model, like you are being creative. You are an artist in that sense. I think we often get confused between what creativity is and what expression is, but creativity is problem solving, which is what these AI builders are doing in the same way in which many filmmakers, writers, yeah. creatives. So it's interesting that perhaps it's just swaying more into that um, coding world as opposed to playing with, you know, um, iPads and artworks. Yeah. But it's it's still the same thing. <laughs> You're still, in a way, solving creative problems yeah. and being creative and, and letting your that creative part of your brain um, grow. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Cool, well, magic man. It was cool to catch up. Yeah. Oh, well, thanks. Thanks, <laughs> thanks a for lot. popping in. <laughs> thanks. Usually, thanks. usually the point of um, these these visits is for me to try and find something for you to rent, as if you've walked into the the video store. But I think it was today was all about you, which I appreciate. <laughs> Love it. <laughs> thanks a lot. Cheers, man. Cheers. Awesome. Thanks. All right, what a lecker chat. Mm. Lovely dude. Always very calm. Yeah, he <laughs> seems very chill. <laughs> very, yeah, very chill. Very. I, I just appreciate people that, that, that use their words very carefully and, and, and speak well. <laughs> um, but yeah, great to always catch up with those people. It's great to identify those kinds of people in your life and just keep them as close as you can, even though you're on the other side of the world. You, mm. you make a point of of staying close because they mm. do interesting things. I mean, even if it's not entirely altruistic, like you just want to know what they're doing, yeah, <laughs> and, and just um, learn from them, really, which is which is amazing. So, mm. um, so yeah, I love the rating system. 
of uh, Little White Lies. Yeah, it's really interesting. It was great to be reminded of that, despite reading the magazine a lot. Um, but it's been a while. Obviously, since Darcy left, my supply, my supply has been cut off. I know. <laughs> <laughs> and you don't see Little White Lies, you know, in the shelves no, in no. South Africa, which is a real pity. Maybe we must um, reinvigorate that um, with them and try and get stock somehow for the bioscope. Yeah. They always flew off the shelf whenever we had them. It's really cool. People for people that don't know Little White Lies, the best thing about it, or I think the thing that they did really, really well, is the custom art that mm. they put on the front cover. It's amazing. Yeah. Well, it makes it a collector's item. Throughout yeah. the magazine. So you it's it's literally the one of the only magazines I've ever kept. Mm. Yeah. You know, and just you know, the the era of magazines is very much over yeah. to some degree. And, you know, they were usually the kind of thing that was a pile next to the toilet. Do you remember that? Yeah. <laughs> so um, the Bioscope's taken on um, a lovely person as a cinema events manager, Celine. And she's in her mm, early, mid-20s. And um, I picked up a, a copy of One Small Seed once here okay. in 44 Stanley. They were nice. selling it at the, at the bookstore. And, and that, that was a really cool magazine, a cool design magazine that was South African. Right. And I showed it to her, and we had this whole discussion about life, like old, <laughs> older life, where it was basically like, I was like, these were important magazines. Yeah. These really helped dictate our culture, what we loved, who we admired. Mm. This was all pre-social media. And at one point, she said, like, what, what, did, what did you guys do before <laughs> phones? <laughs> And um, and it was great to think about it. And I, and the one thing that I said was like, we actually, we read a lot of magazines. Yeah. And you know, now it's quite hard to go to the toilet without your phone. <laughs> yes. You're sort of like, what do I do? Do yes. I just like stare at the wall? Like, what? <laughs> you know? Um, but if you think about it, back in the day, there was like a pile of magazines next to the toilet. Yeah. Next to the Reader's Digest. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so funny. But anyways, these are not magazines to read on the toilet. These are Real, as you said, almost collector's items, which yeah. is amazing. Um, so yeah, great to great to chat. And then it also had me think about where AI has been presented and where it's done, where it's been presented well in movies. Mm. And I think one thing that was kind of interesting to come back to was when we watched um, Mission Impossible, the latest uh, Mission yeah. Impossible, Dead Reckoning. We watched part one, part two is coming soon. The bad guy is AI. Yeah. Mm. And I made the really <laughs> rookie error at the time on the show to go, yeah, this is like the first time like AI has been the bad guy. And you guys were like, Jesus. <laughs> Come on, man. <laughs> Terminator. <laughs> and then you, uh, there's so many other examples. Yeah. But I think for those, I think of Terminator as like, you know, these like robot men. Yes. And it's all a bit fucking ridiculous. What made Mission Impossible quite smart is that it was a little bit more plausible. Right. In terms of how AI could be the bad guy, right? Mm. And it was just this thing that existed in the electronics. Yeah, you know what I mean. It wasn't this robot that was coming to Earth and fighting <laughs> wars. It was just the fact that this robot can see and do anything. Yeah, it's stuck in a Russian submarine. I thought that was a cool thing. Yes, <laughs> it's always well, got to well, be Russians. Was it Russian? I think so. Yeah. Uh, it, oh, if that's that's correctly. where it was. Hey, yeah, that's, that's where it was where created. It's housed, yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, the movie opens with that submarine sinking, and it's still there. Yes. Let's see. Oh, okay. That's where they're going in the next okay. one. Yeah, it's, I mean, it's crazy and silly, mm. but somewhat possible. And watch Tom Cruise is going to yeah. have to dive like 400 meters to go get <laughs> He's really going to do it. <laughs> well, so just even something so basic, yeah. which is the fact that the Bioscope, as we've mentioned, has gotten this exciting upgrade. Yes. Right? So we've got this DCP system and we've got this way of controlling the projector through our computer and it's a relatively complicated thing to start off with but once you know it it's, yeah. it's relatively easy but the guys who set it up um also installed um what i think is relatively basic software which mm. is the ability to go into each other's computers it's uh, called like any desk or something right, right. it's like remote desktop control. yeah yeah, yeah. Oh. And I um, have needed it because right. every now and again, it's like it's, there's a pressure moment, something's coming up, and then he quickly logs in and helps me change and fix something. Right. But I'm watching this dude like <laughs> on my computer yeah. doing stuff. Yeah. So it's like, 
<laughs> Sorry, this is the very sort of like late 30s um, millennial in me. But like th- that's kind of just shows you like, yeah. where we're at. I that, said that's a, a commonplace. Yeah. So, so imagine a super thing. smart, highly advanced AI. Like it's very possible to just go into each other's computers. Yeah. No, it's nuts. I had to set up a remote desktop for my grandmother because uh. I realized I'm, I'm no longer – going to do phone calls trying to describe to you what to do yes because then you have to ask her where are you what do you see and that yeah. is a nightmare with an 82 year old woman yeah so i was like i went to her house i put on remote desktop view, and i'm like okay nanny next time you need my help this is what you're going to do you're just going to start this program up and i'm going to log in and i'm going to take control of your computer yeah. like what what about someone else if i let you do it then the whole world's going to do it cole and I'm like, no, Nanny, it's it's going to be fine. I'll help you out from a distance. You know? So imagine 50 plus years on you yeah. you know, and someone saying, I'm going to control your computer. Yes, <laughs> yeah, it is wild. Imagine in your life, you you go from having zero electronics and computers <laughs> and now at 82, your grandson's like, okay, Nanny, we have to get you fiber yeah. and then we have to upload your family photos to the cloud. Yeah. I remember the funniest thing I heard her say once was, but now, if they're on the cloud and I want to get them, do I have to go up there? And mm. she went up with her hands and mm. fetched them. Yeah. <laughs> shout, out, shout out to the movie Sex Tape with oh, yeah. Cameron Diaz and um, Jason Segel, where he kept <laughs> the running joke throughout the movie is like, on the cloud. Right. On the cloud. It's in the cloud. And, and she sort of kept going like, do you really think it's like in a cloud? Like, <laughs> like, like what the fuck? They record a sex. They record like a, themselves having sex and then they mistakenly upload it. So that uh, means like everyone in their network and devices uh, are now yeah. going to be able to access the sex tape. It's, it's, it's relatively funny. That's cool. Um, speaking of fun romps uh, cool <laughs> there's a good segue <laughs> really um we watched argyle yes yeah. last week which is um a film now in cinemas uh, as we speak uh, when this episode comes out uh it is a it is a fun film i think we'll start with that um quick back of the box it's really hard to give a back of the box because it's got lots of twists and turns but it's a sort of fun action adventure um, where basically we have Jessica Chastain, who is a author. Bryce Dallas Howard. Oh, my bad. <laughs> yeah, you got Jesus. the two gingers confused. <gasps> People do that all the time. Yeah. Totally, right? Okay, this is Bryce Dallas Howard. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, my apologies <laughs> to all the gingers in the world. Um, no, but they do get often yeah. mistaked. My bad. Um, okay, Bryce Dallas Howard, whose father is Ron Howard. Correct. Very famous director. Yeah. Uh, she is a author of a bunch of crime books um, where her main character is Argyle, who's like yeah. a sort of a little bit of a preposterous James Bondy character. Yeah. Um, with the worst haircut in the world. With the worst haircut <laughs> in the world. It's the biggest crime in the film. And, um, and then the setup of the film, so there is so much more to it, is the fact that she then discovers that her books are very true to what's happening in real life and that she is now in danger because people now believe she holds the key to sort of what could happen next. Yes. She because, predicts. She's, because she's been predicting. But of course, there is just so much more to it. Mm. Yeah. Um, and it was fun. Yeah. I don't think it's going to change the zeitgeist. No. And I think it might be a little bit more fun at home streaming on a sort of Sunday afternoon. Yeah. Um, it's a stream it movie, perhaps. But I do want to encourage movie going. So if you if you do want to uh, go out and see it, it is in in cinemas, and yeah. I think it's it, it's a fun movie to watch on a big scale, I guess. Yeah. Um, but yeah, we we enjoyed it. Hey, any yeah. thoughts? It was. I think the best thing about it was Sam Rockwell. Oh yes, yes. by a mile, dude. Yeah. So Sam Rockwell delivers in the in the kooky way that he normally does. Um, he plays who you think is a good guy um, coming to help her. Hmm. Um, and he's also sort of like a spy. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Exactly. And she takes her cat along, which I thought was very underutilized. Yes. I agree. Which is weird. Yeah. Okay. It was like I, one I, think there was a, I think there was enough of the cat. No ways. <laughs> okay. You want more. was barely involved. Yeah. So yeah. throughout the movie, the, her cat is on this adventure. And she's got one of those like kooky backpacks where there's a little viewing hole for yes. the cat. 
Yeah. Um, and Which, they make a bit of fun with it. By the way, that backpack is the reason why there is a sort of conspiracy that Taylor Swift yes. wrote, the, wrote the story. Yes. Which I've is heard insane. This. So what? the Swift, Swifties believe that she was somehow, that Taylor Swift was somehow involved in this movie. Yes. They so both, like, like we were talking about, there is an actual book now yes. that's called Argyle. Which is essentially a form of marketing. Yes. It's so, an entire novel based around this, the, fic- the fictional character in the story of the movie. Yeah. So that's, that was something that, that we experienced shortly after. I always go into exclusive books. Um, I often um, get inspiration for what we can buy in our gift shop. Yeah. So I often look for films or books that have become film. And in the fiction section, I saw... Argyle, and it was written by the character's yes. name. And so I was like, oh, this is genius. And I m- immediately was like, wait, is this the movie? Mm-hmm. Or what is this? And then I, I, scro- I scrolled through the book, and it was all just spy Argyle yes. stuff. And I even went to the end to right. be like, is it the movie's end? Yeah. But it was something else. Right. And I was like, oh, this is genius. They've, mm. they've, they've planted this. Um, and this is the book, one of the books yes. that she writes, which is a fictional book. Yeah. Mm. And then even like in interviews and stuff, they're, they're talking about it like it's a real thing. Yeah. Like, that, so um, that came first. I think they put the book in shelves mm. first. Um, and it was just a smart marketing move. But like and Matthew Vaughn that. in interviews was like, yeah, it's based on the fourth Argyle book. That's yeah, like yeah, the, what yeah. they, that's what the one they used for the movie. And it's like, there is no fourth Argyle book. <laughs> there's, no, there's no Argyle book. Yeah. yeah, yeah. It is smart, and that's cool. So uh, uh, Matthew Vaughan, it's perhaps quite cool to know where this, who the director is and, yeah. and the context of the movie. Um, he made all the Kingsman movies. Yeah. Also was, Kick-Ass and X-Men, Kick-Ass, First, X-Men First, Class. First Class. Yeah. yeah. Kick-Ass was, was fun. Yeah. Mm. That was cool. Mm-hmm. Uh, uh, which one was First X-Men Class? X-Men First Class. Which one was First Class? That was the, the one, first one with Michael Fassbender yeah. and James McAvoy. Oh, uh, the first kind of like prequel movie. Mm. Yes. Oh, that was cool. That was fantastic. And then the great. Kingsman movies are very similar to Argyle, I think, yeah. in, in their frequency where it's yes. like they're fun, they're preposterous, they're having fun as a mm. film. So that's what I mean. That's why I wanted to lead with like, it's not shit. It's, yeah. It's, it's silly. Mm. Um, it should have been sillier. Perhaps. Like, like, for example, like if you look at like Kingsman is a good example of this, like the ending of the first Kingsman. Right, if you think mm. about the climax of that movie, yes, where it's like bonkers and people's heads are exploding, yes, and it's all this like it's a similar image that we get to to the end of this. I don't want to get into, into yes. like specifics, yeah, but like multicolored smoke as people's heads are exploding, yes, it's like obviously like an image that Matthew Vaughan likes, right? But the thing about that movie is it sets the entire takes the entire movie to set up like a tone and a style where where you reach that point, you're not going oh this feels weird, yeah, exactly. and it's out of place. But exactly. when they do it in this. The whole movie hasn't been preposterous enough, right? For by the time you reach that point, you go, okay, this feels like it belongs in this movie. Totally, it was tonally, yeah, like all over the place. Yeah, it started Argyle, off feel like feeling like it was a hallmark movie. <laughs> yeah, well, even, but even before that, Argyle starts with a scene from her book. Yes, where Henry Cavill, who plays Argyle, yes. is in this, and John Cena's there, and Dua Lipa tries her best <laughs> to to act through one or two scenes and it was a bit silly but not in a fun way it was like what it, it there starts, was a moment where i was like wait is this the, what the whole movie is yeah. oh, that like, when she says can you dance yes and he doesn't dance yes. mm. and then she's like the answer is yes and i'm like no it's not <laughs> yeah. he can't dance he but like, like stepped to the left a bit even in that way it starts like a james bond movie james bond movies almost always start with an unrelated action scene. Yeah. That's yeah. Yeah. related to the plot, yeah. yes. Yeah. That's exactly the way this starts. Yes. And like you were saying, like, the writing of her novel seems terrible. Yeah. Like she seems like a bad writer, and I can't Absolutely. help but feel like, I hope it's intentional. Like yeah. they're almost doing like, what if Twilight but James Bond? Like yes. that's what her books are like. Yeah, exactly. I hope but that's intentional. No, I yes. think that's the problem. Yeah. But yeah, there were definitely these moments where it was like, I am going to take all reason out and mm-hmm. we are just going to have a cool action sequence. Yeah. Yes. And we are going to focus on that almost like it's its own like music video. Yes. And those are cool. Mm. I yes. like that. I like the I, freedom of that. Matthew like Vaughn's very good at that. I think we need more like silly, stupid idea yeah. fun. I don't know who I was talking to about this, but 
it remi- it felt like for me this is a little personal story of mm. like we had a class called movement and mm. varsity where in our acting component and of course none of us or at least I wasn't trying to be an actor yeah. I had to take these as part of my dramatic arts degree right. I, I wanted to be film yes but we had to take these two years of performance but it was cool because we had voice and we had acting and we had movement and movement was what I think we called it in the one episode flopsy body right. flopsy body <laughs> movement yes <laughs> like arty like my body's a candle <laughs> like kind of silly and we only got given um, in this class like certain kind of moves we could do. And then we had this one assignment once where we had to create our own dance. And everyone used just variations of the few phrases we'd been given, right? Right. Certain moves. Where myself and this other dude, um, shout out to Nick, um, who's Pule, he's part of Bomb Shelter Beast. Cool. Great dude. Very interesting, creative um, person. We were like, let's make the silliest, dumbest, dance yes. just for absolute shits and giggles yeah. like why the fuck not <laughs> let's just be completely ridiculous yeah and we gave it this stupid name and we did this whole narrative about birth and death and it was <laughs> preposterous and yeah. it was not the brief but we had the best time and that's kind of what you you think on this huge multi-million dollar scale some yeah. of these guys do where they're like let's have the most ridiculous fun with the sequence <laughs> yeah. where there's oil on the floor. I don't want to give too much away, yeah. but I, this is just a moment in the film of Argyle and there's oil on the floor, but how do you get through it? And then all of a sudden she remembers she's a figure skater. Yeah. So she fashions these figure skating Insane. things and then skates around an oil yeah. rig, you yeah. know, like a floor covered in oil. And it's, it's just a great sequence. It's lots of fun. Exactly. It's inventive yeah. and it tries yeah. to be inventive, which yeah. is, I think it's strength. Mm. Yeah. But so, yeah. So 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 that's the that's yeah. the feeling. Matthew Vaughan works better in like an R-rated space though. Yeah. As opposed to PG-13. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, there were one or two moments, but yeah, it was perhaps not enough. Yeah. Um speaking on the other side of fun, <laughs> <laughs> we then watched The Zone of Interest. Yeah. Um the Bioscope uh, as I've said has has done this big upgrade this year where we are now in the position to screen the films that are coming from bigger distributors mm. and bigger studio films and 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 the zone of interest is one of them it is a film nominated for a host of oscars this year yeah. including best film best director uh, best international film which is interesting that it's in both categories which yeah. is which is very cool and and i've just heard it's incredible it won the grand prize at Cannes. Mm. so it's quite a, it's kind of an interesting position for me to see these films coming and all I get is the reviews. Yes. And all I get and I've got to pick whether or not the bioscope should take on a film because we've yeah. only got one cinema. Yeah. But it's like when you look at those accolades you're like okay, yes <laughs> this is not a fly by night. Like no. this is clearly doing something. Yeah. yeah. That is exciting. Like so what we know about it is we know it's in World War 2. And we know it is about the family that live next door to Auschwitz. Yeah. Because the the patriarch of this family works in the camp. Yeah. And as the, the head of the as camp. As the head of the yeah. camp. I mean, you yeah. don't, but I'm just, the trailer doesn't give you much. Oh, no, yeah. The trailer gives you these like little vignettes, little scenes, little moments in the house mm. intercut with like, this is the greatest movie in the fucking world. <laughs> so yes. it's like, it's really hard. You yes. know, all the reviews. <laughs> yes. So you're like, you're like, I got nothing from yeah. the trailer apart from the fact that this is in, apparently incredible. Yeah. Um, and then um, we then, um, I don't think this is a problem to announce, but once the film unlocked on our system, I really wanted to watch it because mm. I want to know what um, I'm going to screen. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I think that's important. But um, I also host a podcast where we talk about movies. And yeah. so... My two chummies, Colin Graham, <laughs> uh, joined me for a private screening of this film so that we could review it. Yeah. So we watched it in the bioscope, which I think was nice and fun. Mm. Um, except the movie wasn't nice and fun. Yeah. But the movie is incredible, and I want to talk about it. Yeah. And I think what is perhaps a good place to start is the fact that we left very quiet, yeah. very somber, and I think you said it 
in a social media post where you said, I- I'm going to need some time. Yeah. It was like emotionally drained in yeah. that movie. Yes. Yeah. So it is incredible and it is definitely worth your time. Mm. And we would love you to come and watch it at the Bioscope because screenings are continuing. Cool. But on that note, perhaps Cole, kick it off. What do you think? Yeah, I think like for a film that shows you no visual violence in the Holocaust, which you're yeah. not used to. Like if you think about The Pianist, if you think about Schindler's List and a host of other Holocaust films. Yeah. You're used to seeing the images, right, that you see in black and whites in mm. history textbooks. And then here you don't see any of those, right? Yeah. But the impact of the film is still the same yeah. because all of that violence is delivered through contrast, mm. right? Yeah. So you're seeing the idyllic life. Yeah, There's like one hint of him being in the camp, but even then... It's a close-up, actually. It's, it's one of the few close-ups, close-ups in the yeah. whole film. Yeah. Um, mm-hmm. Where you're hearing the sound around him yeah. and you, in your mind, are trying to like figure out what he's seeing yes. or what you're hearing beyond the perimeter of the camp. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You're hearing screams, you're hearing gunshots in the yeah. distance. Like when you're seeing people just going about their business in the home and you hear a gunshot in the dis- yeah. distance and no one reacts. Yes. You sit there yeah. and you're like, what and it's the, the whole time. time. Like the, every time they're in the house, you can hear the camp constantly. Yes. Yeah. yeah. It's so, like this constant presence of noise. So that's that's really the premise of the film. Yeah. Absolutely. Is that you you see this life of this family. Yeah. And their day to days, and some of them are quite mundane things like vegetable gardens and the frolicking in the swimming pool. It does get bigger, and there are other issues at play, and things happen. But throughout the movie, you've got this wall often seen in the background and you've got the sort of towers of the camp behind Mm. and as you said you hear this like sort Mm. of Mm. like screams in the in the background and you see the plume of smoke coming out of the chimney and they're devising yeah and then at one point they sort of show the devising of of how they're going to make the camp this more extermination camp yeah. and yeah how they're going to upgrade the incinerator so that their turnaround is better yeah yeah like, like just like a crematorium and i think it's like the presentation of life in auschwitz yes. and being higher up in the nazi party as being mm. like this is just a day-to-day yes. like tree of life-esque yeah. observation of these yeah. people yeah and the way they like normalize that with their camera is it puts you in a position as a viewer where you just sit there going i don't want to be watching this yeah. you know yeah. And you're being confronted with it, and you're just like, these people thought it was normal. Yeah, it like I was thinking about that during the movie. It's like, how did an entire country become convinced that this was the right thing to do? Yeah, yeah, it's it's, it's a wild, such a difficult question. It's a very wild position, and I think a lot of Germans, yeah, grapple with that. Yes, and on a tiny, very different local level, I often drive through Joburg, and I'm like, how did we, how did we accept the fact that these pavements are not cut no. and shit and poles are falling down. Like, when did we get to the point in South Africa mm. and Joburg where this was okay? Yeah. yeah. No, m- most other cities in the world that call themselves proper established cities, mm. they don't have this. When, yeah. did, we, when did we accept weeds? Yeah. F- fuck this. Yeah. But yeah. It's a slow degradation and yes. it's a slow change and it's a yeah. slow this where all of a sudden you desensitize to that point yeah. where this can happen and, and you fucking somehow think it's okay mm. it's wild mm. um another exciting or well, not exciting another another um interesting aspect of the film for for the more perhaps the more production conscious filmmaker cinephile types you'd appreciate the fact that the film is very simply made and doesn't have big lighting in it mm. and like studio not studio but like film lighting you know, where every shot is set up very carefully with, you know, very romantic or very carefully placed light. A lot of the movie has nothing in it. Mm. Um, right. Very little score, very little, you know, actual lighting. It's very natural looking. And, yeah. and that was all very purposefully done. They wanted to feel like you were literally just standing there in the house next yeah. to them. Not in this, like, beautifully done up scene. Yeah. You know, like Argyle, for example, is... That's where that's where these films get to two hundred million or however big exactly, budgets yeah. are. It's because every shot is they've taken a whole day to set up, mm. and these actors will shoot two or three scenes a day, and they'll spend most of the time in the trailer because everyone else is like getting the lighting perfect. Yeah. Yeah. Where here they probably could have. I think we we were speaking about it earlier. I think they apparently they hid some of the cameras and the yeah. walls, 
So it just felt very natural. And of course, the zone of interest doesn't have any act, like famous actors. Yeah. And it's just often the shot is just left to and play I think out. Like that kind of naturalism, yeah. I think, is incredibly hard to pull off. Yeah. Like yeah, especially so from I, an acting perspective. I, yeah. I made that when we were sort of digesting it afterwards. I sort of I made that comment, which was wrong. I sort of said, it's very simple. It was almost like, why, wait, why is he getting best director? Yeah. It, it almost feels like he didn't do anything. <laughs> and then I was like, okay, no, that's a rookie yeah. comment to make. Of course he did plenty. Yeah. But it doesn't feel like he did anything. Exactly. It doesn't feel like he even gave direction. It doesn't feel yeah. like he set up the shot. It's, it's like, exactly. But of course... There's reasons if that, why. Like, if that illusion fools you, yeah. then the job's been done incredibly well. Yeah. You know? Um, and yeah, I had a thought about the composition you were talking about as you were saying it, like it's simply set up mm. and you feel like you're a fly on the wall in this house. And I, I kept on going back to Wes Anderson in my mind watching this, where Wes Anderson feels like to the point now where it's like contrived symmetry. Yes. Right? It's like it's, it's too it's, much. Yeah. It's, it's too much. It's very obvious. And this kind of composition is playing in a similar space where there's like really cool principles about, you know, light versus shade, verticals and horizontals, diagonal yeah. lines. And all of that is considered in the same way that Wes Anderson would find like perfect symmetry in a, in a shot. Yeah. Yeah. So like all of it is incredibly visually satisfying, but it's a home. It's like dressed to be simple, mm. but within the limitations of that normal space, mm. you know, it. it I absolutely yeah, love that point. Very, very much worth your time, and um, the perhaps a, a good segue. Unless anyone's got anything else to I don't say watch about, it with your mom. <laughs> don't watch it with your mom. <laughs> yeah. Um, um, speaking of like a very carefully considered production look and feel, mm. um, what's exciting is a film coming up. So in the week of this episode being released on Friday the holdovers starts mm. and the holdovers is another oscar film that's been nominated for a bunch of oscars so it's so exciting that the bioscope's going to now be screening um the zone of interest poor things and now the holdovers and the holdovers at least looks a little more fun yeah a little more light yeah um it is alexander payne who's also another very like auteur well-known very confident director yeah, if you've watched sideways the descendants yeah. Not yeah. sure of any others. So he's 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 been in the game for mm. a while. Sideways is of course a really great film that stars Paul Giamatti. This yeah. is him working with Paul Giamatti again, and he's been nominated for Best Actor. Yeah, yeah. Just the thought of Paul Giamatti winning Best Actor would be amazing. <laughs> yes. Yeah, because he won Golden Globe for it. Did he? Yeah, and there's a great there was a great paying attention. There was a great picture of him at the In and Out Burger, like <laughs> in LA across the street, like at the counter with his Golden Globe <laughs> that is so, sick. at the counter ordering an In and Out Burger. Um, it's a, the basic premise from what we can see is, is it's like a set in the seventies, but they very carefully wanted to make the film as if it was actually made in the seventies. Yes. So they used not just the, the set, the art direction, that's what everyone would normally do, but they used the cameras and they used all these things to sort of make it very, often you, you get the seventies, but you get like a perfect seventies car. So he yeah. was like, he was like, we wanted seventies cars, but they had to be a bit fucked up. Yes, do you know what I mean? Right. So it's like, it's a, it's a little bit more true to life, right? In that regard, and it's about um, Paul Giamatti is a teacher and uh, at a very fancy school by mm. the sounds of it, and it is now the Christmas break. Yes, and everybody goes home in this boarding school, but there's always going to be at least one or two students that have to stay. Yeah, over Christmas. So this whole film seems to be set between. One of the students that stays, him as the teacher who has to look after them, and the cook, from what I can I think so, yeah, that's what I've gathered as is well. Is that what a holdover is? Is it one of the students that stays? Yeah, that I has think, to stay yes. the summer okay, because I guess they cool. don't have a, a family or yeah. thing to go home to. So that's what seems to be the premise. Mm. It's very fun. I'm very excited, and tickets are on sale. Cool. <laughs> <laughs> at the pie scoop, that's it at the day. Nice. <laughs> um, but yeah. Uh, let's talk about other things. Yes. Uh, TV shows, you started something cool? I watched the first episode, so the whole thing's out, but I only watched the first episode of Mr. and Mrs. Smith ah. on Prime Video. Okay. So it's it's kind of a remake in name only. Okay, in so the remem sense, yeah, remember the, Mr. and Mrs. Smith was the big 
Brad Pitt, Pitt Angelina. Yeah, the Brad Pitt Angelina Jolie movie where, where the greatest era of pop culture started. <laughs> yeah, for Angelina. We're combining people's names together. Yeah, well, what that's a, when they, what a, no, that's where their relationship started, wasn't yes. it? That's when he cheated on Jennifer Aniston. Yeah, and then he was with her for the longest time. For a long, yeah, quite a yeah. while. Um, yeah. But okay, but it's a, a movie about two a couple who've been married for several years who learn that they're both assassins mm. for like agencies that are like in competition with one another. Okay. Right. But now this remake, which is um, it's Donald Glover mm. and mm. let who me look it up. Who, who we know as Childish Gambino. Yes. And Lando Calrissian. Troy, Lando Troy Calrissian from, from Community. Community. Yes. Who was the dorm leader in NYU for a bunch of my friends. So oh, they wild. like know Donald Glover. Oh, wow. That's and cool. And they were like, he was amazing then. And of course, they're so proud of this like, this varsity dorm leader friend that they had. Um, and they said they saw him on the streets sort of years later in the sort of community era, recognized them and was such a cool dude. All right. Oh, I like so there's always a nice story to tell. Yeah. Okay. So this is Donald Glover and Maya Erskine. Okay. Who's that? Um, she's in, you mentioned Blue Art Samurai. Oh, yeah. She's like the lead voice in that. Sick. Um, but so they work for an as yet unnamed agency that they've been recruited by, and they have to pretend to be a married couple. So they're not an actual married couple who now have to try and kill each other. They're pretending uh, to be a married couple in order to be like... That's what's different from the Angelina yes. Jolie Brad Pitt. Yeah, well, that, that makes cool. more sense. Yeah. Yes. And I mean, I like, just love the fact that there's like, you know, one can still go like, you're an assassin. Yeah. That's your profession. It's like, really? <laughs> but I guess they do exist. Yeah, they have they to. They are out there. Shout out to the um, Sarah, the Sara Bletcher episode of the video store when we were talking about Senzo, the Bafana Bafana captain, you know, who got killed. Yes. And she made the Netflix series about right. the true crime story about him. And she at one point like, spend time with like hitmen right <laughs> she was like welcomed into their house wild to, oh my to god sort of shoot this and this the, he was a hitman and his dad was a hitman and like, the grandfather was and <laughs> what like, the hell and you think like is this dangerous like this is crazy she's like no i was the most protected one could ever be in the township or <laughs> neighborhood or wherever she was because she was in the hitman's house oh but they, they do exist yeah. they do walk among us so like <laughs> That's a perfect example of what... Uh, we'll come back to it, Graham. Sorry, yeah, we're interrupting I was about you. to say we're really bad at staying on topic. <laughs> it's terrible. But, we, but it's, it's a, okay. what um, Russell said once, we had an interesting discussion about Sideways and we were talking about what a good premise it was. Um, and Russ had a good comment where he said, like, we have Winelands. Mm -hmm. That is such a simple present, uh, premise. Yeah. Why the hell haven't we told that story here? We don't have these stories about everyday South Africans because we don't know ourselves well enough, one... Mm. And here you're telling me that there's a house with a family lineage of hitmen in the township. Yes. Like, that what would the be, fuck? Why that is would, that not a film? Yeah. <laughs> Sideways Sideways was this, go back to Holdovers, yeah. um, Paul Giamatti and Alexander Payne. But Sideways is this great film where two guys go on a bachelor's weekend um, in the Napa Valley. Yeah. And it was our lecturer, our screenwriter lecturer at the time that said, Watch this movie. It's amazing. It's very well written. It's funny. It's endearing. It's amazing. This could have been written in Cape Town. Mm. Totally. So, yeah, that was inspiring. Um, okay, back to Mr. and Mrs. Smith. I can't remember what I was going to say. Oh, I'm so um, sorry. Yeah, we were talking about the premise and how they've changed it, which is really yeah. interesting. I like that idea. And, like, the tone is totally different because of that. Like, the movie is quite, like overtly goofy in like a sense of humor and that sort of thing. Okay. Whereas this, while it's not lacking humor, they aren't like jokes per se. The humor more comes from like the awkwardness of these two people who have never met before now having to be a married couple and trying to get to know each other. And like Donald Glover's character is like way more prying and trying to get information out of her. She's like way more closed up. But they never like overtly say these things. Yeah. You just get like these little insights into their characters and how they respond to them. And the way we're introduced to the character is the way they're recruited is they've been contacted somehow and they go into this room and there's like this little gray box thing with a screen on it. And it just says print like words appear in it that ask them questions. Yeah. So they have to answer these questions. So we get like this information dump about them and we learn all these little things. But then later on, for like, for example, they're having a conversation and she asks him one of the questions they were asked. Yeah. In this thing. And he lies to her. 
he gives a different answer to the answer he gave to begin with. Oh, so the audience and immediately now go, knows. okay, cool. Why would he lie about that? Oh, shit. Like just so like, little things like that. Based on the first episode, hook. Yes. Are you hooked? Yeah, I'm definitely going to give it at least one more and see where it goes. Okay, right. Yeah. That's good to know. Shout out, by the way, to a very popular anime. Yes. <laughs> it's tangent. Called Spy <laughs> Family, which oh, right. is pretty much the original Mr. and Mrs. Smith okay. premise. And it's super popular cool. and kind of fun to watch, but also very anime. So if you're yes. an anime fan, it's a fantastic watch okay, as well. Cool. But someone else mentioned it. Someone, I don't know. I always think it's interesting what comes up in a little casual conversation at a braai or yeah. with, with mm-hmm. a group of people. Because we end up having the, let's call it the video store conversation. Yes. Which is like, oh, you should see this. Oh, have you seen this? Oh. And why I call it the video store conversation is as we were setting up the podcast with yeah. my friends, I tended to interrupt and go, guys, so you know the <laughs> podcast that I'm talking about yes. that I really want to start? It's this. Right. This is the conversation. Yeah. Oh my God, oh, have you seen that? Oh, fuck, you should see this. Exactly. And so I always do find it interesting that when I do find myself in that conversation with, with people, yeah. what shows they are now talking about right. at any given time. And someone did tell me about Mr. and Mrs. Smith this last week. Okay, cool. I forget who and how. But they said what was fun was that they're not super professional. <laughs> like, no. They're like, still, what, learning? Like she says like in that opening interview thing that she tried to, she like tried out for the CIA and she didn't get accepted. Yeah. Because like, so th- this agency that they're walking for, they, know, they don't even know who it is. They've just been like covertly recruited by these people. Yeah. So they don't actually know who they're working for. He's like former military. He says something about he was part of like the first like drone operators in Afghanistan and that okay. sort of thing. And she was someone who tried to get into the CIA. She's gone through college and all this stuff. Because apparently like they, they not necessarily that good at killing. Yes. Like every now and again they might make a mistake. Yeah. And then, of course, one plays, as you said, with this awkward moment. Yeah. I love it. I love it. I love seeing nuance. Mm. Like, if you compared the the romp, the, <laughs> the Brangelina, yes. you know, everything's too professional and too... Yeah. Like, like, where nowadays, like, one would make a TV show and the joke would be the nuance. Yes. Like, right. what happens if you don't shoot the person properly? Yeah. And they don't die. Like, what, what do you do? And, like, if this gets awkward, because that's what life is. Yeah. You know, it's not like a silky love scene that's perfect. Like, yeah. sex isn't that. <laughs> and so there's a lot of humor in what could be awkward or yeah. go wrong or the subtleties. Mm. Throwback to Argyle. That's pretty much what the comparison between Henry Cavill and Sam Rockwell is, yes, right? The idealized exactly. spy versus the real spy. Yeah. yeah, no, that's a good point. Yeah. 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 Lovely. Bring it uh, back home. I watched um, Maverick last night. Oh, right. Really? It's come to, it's come to Netflix. <laughs> Um, I was there for it when it came to South Africa and I was in a nice packed theater and I <laughs> loved it. And of course, I watched Top Gun when I was younger. Right. So it was, it was, a, it was a great watch however many years ago, two mm. years ago. Yeah, it yeah, was a while. And uh, now on Netflix and it was very cool to um, tell Leslie who m- she's not sure whether she saw the first one. Mm. which I think means she didn't. Um, <laughs> and, uh, it was You'd very... remember. You'd yeah, remember Goose. I think so. And Iceman. Yeah. I th- maybe maybe like a horsey girl <laughs> might not remember a, like a, a airplane movie. Yeah. No, totally. Dogfight. A dogfight movie. Um, but it was very cool to show, like, show her all the ways in which it paid tribute to the first one. Right. You know, down to the like perfect opening sequence which mm-hmm. was very similar to the original top gun yes and just little things like the football on the beach scene yes. was very much a homage to the volleyball yes. scene from yeah. the original and um and it's a great solid rewatch it was so cool to like watch it so again good. and and just remember all those things like when you watched maverick for the first time you were like wait where are we yes who, who the bad guys again <laughs> yes and they purposefully made it very yeah. ambiguous. Vague. Yes. But when you rewatch it, you're like, no, they said Iran about four or five times. Uh, okay. In Interesting. My head, it, in my head, it was like once. <laughs> but no, there was sort of four or five mentions. But then I love that when they do arrive in Iran yeah. for the final set piece, it looks like fucking Canada. Yes. And yes. I was like, does Iran get snowy? Yeah. yeah. Does it? Yeah. yeah. People go... Um, was this ice skating? Not ice skating, mm. skiing. Right. When I was in Dubai... I was Dubai, talking to my Turkish students about this and they were showing me how like there's a mountain range and it snows and... Okay. Gosh, no, yeah. I'm sure they've done their research. But like when I was in Dubai in December, I was like, in my head, I was like, what's this ocean? Like, right. what is this body of water? 
And then you go on Google Maps and you're like, oh, it's the Persian Gulf. And yes. you're like, that's, that's cool. And you're like, where, where, where are we again? <laughs> and then you look yes. around and you're like, okay, Yemen's below us. That's interesting. Mm. And then above us is Iran. And I was like, oh, wild. Right. You're there. Like you've just looked at it. And I was there in winter and it was still t-shirt weather. So in my head, I was like, Iran can't get fucking snowy. (laughs) Yeah. But geography, right? Yeah, exactly, dude. (laughs) When you go high, (laughs) it can get cold. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, Okay. Magic, guys. Um, So yeah, Holdovers is exciting. mm. We are um, this week going to be able to watch it ahead of time, which is cool. Um, So yeah, we'll probably post some reviews on that and then... Tickets are on sale at the Bioscope for screenings of holdovers. Mm. But um, oh, it's all very exciting. Yeah. Oh, it's all and very G- exciting and lots of cool stuff. We're going stuff to go coming. watch Dune on IMAX this weekend. Yes. Dune 1. Yes. Yeah. Yes, yes, yes. yes. We that. are building up. It's happening. I'm putting it out into the universe <laughs> and all pieces are in place. But yes. speaking about it now so that there's lots of anticipation, we are building up to a very special Dune episode. Cool. Fuck yeah. Um, where we are going to have uh, Gerald, who's a uh, English lit lecturer from Wits, who taught me, um, who gives a course on Dune. And we just got to find the nuance cool. of exactly how we're going to structure it and how best to do it. Yes. Um, but yeah, Dune Part 2 is coming out First soon. of March. First of March. So they have brought back the first part in the way in which it should be watched, which is IMAX. So, yeah, absolutely. So we're going to go and watch it on IMAX. Do you guys want to hear something crazy about Dune 2? Yeah. Yes. It ends on a cliffhanger. Oh, oh really? Yeah. <laughs> then, he's, then he's building oh, up for Because Danny a wants film, to do Dune Messiah. He yeah. wants to, yeah. Right. Okay, I've heard that he's wanting to do Messiah as his third. Yeah. As the as the third piece. That's cool. Now to read Dune Messiah. Yeah. I've put it off for like so many years. Same. In my head, I was like, I'm just going to do one and done. <laughs> yes. Okay, but there are there's plenty more Dune books. Yeah, um, but Messiah, I believe, is the is the old, is a is a good sort of trilogy because mm. it's the like the remainder of Paul's story. Oh, is it? Yeah, Man, yeah Apparently, some of them are bonkers. Yes, it? yeah. You get a giant worm. God Emperor of Dune, <laughs> yeah. a talking worm man. It's like um, I am. Um, I don't know. Is he like the Muad'Dib or something? I don't know. Careful it's now. Bizarre. Yeah, let's not go too far down this way. <laughs> um, thank you. Thank you, my chums. Yeah. And thanks for today. Thanks for being a part of the chat, Graham. Cool. And um, thank you to everyone who is listening. Yeah. Yeah. We love and treasure you. I'm getting more and more of these conversations now with friends and people I know who are saying, I love the podcast. Awesome. <laughs> and it just brings such joy. And it just makes me want to keep going. Mm. I'm doing it for myself and I'm loving it. Yes. But it, it, do, it certainly doesn't hurt to... Um, to get a compliment mm. here and there. Yeah. Uh, so thank you for listening. Homebase is the video store.co.za, but please chime in. Give us your reviews of films. Yeah. You know, you can post them on um, our Facebook group. So look for the video store in groups. And then also just like tell us tell us what you think mm. in Instagram. Yeah. On this this episode's post. Yeah. Chime in. All right. Uh, thank you for listening, and we will see you again next week. Love you. Bye. Bye. Cheers. You've the got you've got chair. your sign off. Oh, d- does it have to be that? <laughs> I want it to be that. <laughs> oh, does it have to be that now? Okay, fine. Do it again. No, this is it. <laughs> oh, is this it? <laughs> this is it. Oh my god, that is awkward. All of this is staying. <laughs> TTFN. Tata for now. There you thank go. you. <laughs>